When it comes to you and your relationship with God. When it comes to you and your service to God. Do you want to be right with God? Is that a big deal to you to be right? Or could you be satisfied with being wrong with God? If someone shared with you some truth from the Word of God that showed you that you were wrong in some area of your life, would you be concerned about being wrong in that aspect of your relationship with God? Or could you be okay with it? You know, in Acts chapter 11, or Acts chapter 18, there was a man by the name of Apollos. And when Ananias... Uh, not Ananias, that would be Acts chapter 5, when, uh, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him teaching, they recognized he had a lot of things right. He had been taught accurately the ways of the Lord. He had a lot of things right about his understanding of Scripture. But when it came to the topic of baptism, he was wrong. Quill and Priscilla were not satisfied in allowing him to be right about so many things, to just let him go on being wrong about this one thing. The Bible says they took him aside and they explained the way of the Lord more perfectly, more accurately to him. And every indication we have is that Apollos accepted that correction. He did not want to be wrong in that aspect of his relationship with God, that aspect of his understanding of the will of God. He did not want to be wrong with God. He wanted to have an understanding that was right about baptism. He didn't want to be wrong about that subject. You take that and you apply that to any subject matter in our relationship with God and our understanding of the will of God. Do we have that kind of heart where we want to be right? You know the last verse of the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9, the Bible says the ways of the Lord are right. Now, you can argue that verse up one side and down the other, but at the end of the day, it's still going to say that the ways of the Lord are right. And it's up to us to come to the Scripture and allow the Scripture to be our guide. Doesn't the Bible say that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God? That it's profitable for what? For teaching us. How often do we come to the Bible and allow it to teach us? It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. You know, if I'm wrong... I need to be told that I'm wrong, but what if I find that in the Bible? Where I learn that something is wrong and I must be reproved in that area. The Bible says that it is profitable for correction. Well, if I'm wrong, how do I get right? How do I leave what's wrong and turn around to what's right? The Bible shows me. The Bible teaches me what's right. It teaches me what's wrong. It teaches me how to get right. And then it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. It shows me how to keep on being right with God. You want to be right with God? When it comes to the subject of the church, do you want to be right? Do we want to have a right understanding about the subject of the church? Tonight I want us to go to Acts chapter 2. And I want us tonight to use Acts chapter 2 as our guide to an understanding of God's view of the right church. The right church. You see, if in Acts chapter 18, if there was a right baptism, what Apollos was teaching was a wrong baptism. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, the Bible says there is one baptism. So if I'm not teaching, practicing, and following the one baptism, the right baptism, what I'm teaching, practicing, and following must be a wrong baptism. That same passage in Ephesians 4 and verse 4 says there's one body. There's one church. If I do not believe, do not practice, do not follow the Scripture's teaching about the one church, then I'm not in the right church. And if I'm not in the right church, then the only other conclusion is I must be in the wrong church. What does Acts chapter 2 tell us? In Acts chapter 2, we learn about the birth of the Lord's church. You know, God had been planning this forever. 
In Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says that the church was in God's eternal purpose. He had this in mind from eternity. Before He ever created the world, He had the church in mind. That's how much God loved the church. That's how much it was in His scheme, His plan for all of mankind. And so when you pick up your Bibles and you start reading through the Old Testament, you see all sorts of verses that just start pointing towards the coming church. You read about it in Isaiah chapter 2 where it talks about the Lord's house being established. Not some man's house, not some man's church. This is the Lord's house that was going to be established. You see Jesus come on the scene. And in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, John the Baptist is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4 and verse 17, Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 10 and verse 7, Jesus and His disciples out preaching the kingdom, the house, the church. It's right here. You know the verse in Matthew 16 and verse 18 where Jesus said, I will build the Lord's house. I will build my church. Not somebody else's church. God had been planning this. He had been prophesying about it. He had been promising it. When you get to Acts chapter 2, you see the exciting culmination of all of God's plan coming to fruition, coming to fulfillment in the birth of His church. And if it's His church, then it must be the right church. Here's what I want us to do tonight. What you see before you, there's only one slide for our lesson tonight. There's not multiple slides. If you ask Bob how many slides are on the PowerPoint, there's just one. You're looking at it. So when we fill up this screen, that's it. There's not another one to be had. When we fill up this screen, you will know we are done. Now, I used about eight-point type, and I've got about 77 points with eight-point type, so you're going to, no, I'm kidding. But here is the point of our lesson tonight. What can we know about the right church? And we're going to see all of this in Acts chapter 2. The first thing we're going to see about the right church is that the right church started at the right time. Look at Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. The day of Pentecost. This was a day that the Lord had set out in His mind that this was going to be the time when He established His church. Drop down to verse 16. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, the Bible says... Peter says, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This, what is happening on the day of Pentecost. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's what they were seeing. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall see dreams. In Acts chapter 2. The right church is coming to existence at the right time. In fact, go back to Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, we quoted some verses from Matthew's account about what Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. But in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, verse 14 says in Mark chapter 1, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the kingdom of God. And what did he preach when he came to Galilee? In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus came preaching saying, The time is fulfilled. All of these prophecies, all of these times that you're getting ready, you're getting ready, we're preparing for the kingdom. Jesus says, here it is. He said in Matthew's account, it is at hand. He says right here, the time is fulfilled. It's ready. Go back to, Deut- uh, go back to uh, Daniel chapter 2. In verse 44 in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel was uh, interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. The dream that he had of that massive uh, massive, uh, statue that he had seen that had uh, various parts to it. And Daniel interpreted what those various parts of that statue meant. And then he got down to that part of the statue in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. And he said, you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. 
and in the days of this empire. He had already talked to them about the Babylonian empire, the head of gold. He had already talked to them uh, about uh, the Assyrian empire, that breastplate, those arms of silver. He had already talked to them about Greece and what Greece was going to do. You have the, the Babylonians, you have the Medo-Persians, and then you have the Greece, the Grecian empire. But now he comes down to these feet that are made out of iron and mixed with clay. We know this to be from history, the Roman Empire, in the days of these kings. The days of the Roman kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, a house, a church, which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and this kingdom shall stand forever. We could go on and on looking at Joel 2, Isaiah 2, to see that when we come to Acts chapter 2, Isaiah 2 says it's going to happen in the latter days. Joel 2 says it's going to happen in the last days. Daniel 2 says it's going to happen in the days of these kings, the days of the Roman kings. Jesus comes on the scene and He says the time is fulfilled. And we get to Acts chapter 2 and the time is ripe for the right church to be established because it is in Acts 2, the right time, but not just the right time. Gathered there on that occasion are the right men. What men? Go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, comma, what's the word you have after the comma? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, comma, they were all with one accord in one place. They who? Well, you could drop down uh, later in the chapter into verse 14 and to see that Peter standing up with the eleven, raised his voice. Who's the they? Well, the, you read the verses that follow the they, and it is talking about the twelve apostles. But back up one verse from, uh, from chapter 2 and verse 1. Jump over your chapter division to the last verse of Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 26. Where the Bible says that the apostles, the eleven, cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. He would become now the twelfth apostle to take Judas's place, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And the very next verse says, they were gathered together. When you get to Acts chapter 2, you've got the right time. You've got the right men. What, what difference does it make? What difference does it make that it is these men? Go back to Luke chapter 24. Look in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 is the occasion right before Jesus ascends into heaven. It kind of dovetails with, uh, with the teachings of Acts chapter 1. In Luke chapter 24, you might read verse 33 where it says, They rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven. Who are we reading about in Luke chapter 24, the last part of this chapter? We are reading about the apostles. We're reading about the apostles who were gathered together. The end of verse 33 says, what does verse 36 tell us? Verse 36 says, and as they, these 11 apostles, said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and he said to them, peace be unto you. Drop down to verse 44. Verse 44, he said to them, to who? The 11 apostles. Jesus is in a room with the 11 apostles. He says to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so he opened, verse 45, their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. In verse 46, he says, thus it is written and thus it was necessary that the Christ should suffer and arise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you, who? The eleven apostles. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. Jesus told these men... The time is almost here. You get to Acts chapter 2, you got the right time, but do we have the right men? Yes. In Acts chapter 2, those are the men who are gathered up in that upper room. Go back to John chapter 15. Look in John chapter 15. We may not have time to, to look at every one of these, but how significant is it that in Acts chapter 2, it is the 12 apostles who are gathered in that upper room? 
In John chapter 15, let's start in verse 26. In John chapter 15, Jesus is in the upper room with his apostles. On the night in which he was betrayed, the night he instituted the Lord's Supper, the night in which he would head to the Garden of Gethsemane and there pray three times and be arrested and put on trial that very night. Here in John chapter 15, he's in that upper room with his 12 apostles. I want you to see who he's talking to. I want you to see who he is promising things to. Look in John chapter 15, verse 26. See how many times we see the word Y-O-U to these 12 apostles. But when the Helper comes, John 15, 26, whom I shall send to you, look at verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Go right to the next verse, chapter 16, verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Drop down to verse 3. I'm going to skip the one in verse 2. Verse 3, these things we, they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Verse 4, but these things I have told you that when the time comes, you you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. You get the idea? We could go all the way through chapter 16. We could go all the way through chapter 16 and it's you, 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 you. Dozens of times in this chapter. Who's he talking to? The 12 apostles. Who is he making promises to about the coming of the Spirit, about the coming of the church, about the coming of the kingdom? He's making it to the apostles. How do we know we have the right church beginning in Acts chapter 2? Because we've got the right time. God set this time in motion. We've got the right church in Acts chapter 2 because we've got the right men gathered together. Now what else do we have? We've got the right place. Go back to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, they were all with one accord in one place. Now I know that's talking about the room in which they were gathered, but where were they gathered? What does verse 5 say? There were dwelling in Jerusalem. That's where they are. We learned that from chapter 1. We see that in chapter 2, that they were in Jerusalem. Well, what difference does that make? Go back to Isaiah chapter 2. Go to Isaiah chapter 2, and then we're going to go again and see what he said in Luke chapter 24. But go back to Isaiah chapter 2, to one of these great prophecies that was made about the coming kingdom. We already noted that the prophecy was made that the mountain of the Lord's house would be, that the Lord's house would be established uh, on the top of the mountains. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, the church, the kingdom. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, to the church of the kingdom. He will teach us His ways. We shall walk in His paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Where is Zion? And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Where's the church? Where's the house? Where's the kingdom going to start? Oh, it's going to start in the city of Jerusalem. That was prophesied 750 years before Jesus ever came. So before Jesus ascended, go to Luke chapter 24. We saw this. We didn't emphasize it as we were reading through it, but perhaps you saw it in Luke chapter 24, verse, uh, verse 47 and 49, two times. In Luke 24, verse 47, Jesus said, this is going to begin at Jerusalem. Verse 49, He told them, tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus told His disciples, tarry in the city of Jerusalem. You know, wouldn't it be something that if we had all, what, what if we had all of the right elements in Acts chapter 2, but they were gathered in Nashville? I mean, wouldn't that stink to have so many things going for them, but they're in Anchorage? I mean, why in the world would they ever be in Anchorage? Or, to put it more realistic, maybe they're in Antioch. Maybe they're up in Galilee. That's where most of the disciples were from. Isn't it interesting that when we read about the birth of the Lord's church, the right church, that we've got the right time. God didn't mess up the time. We've got the right men gathered there. We have them in the right place. They didn't gather in the wrong place. They gathered in the right place. And when we get to Acts chapter 2, 
we see the right power coming. This was in the passage that Joel read. Look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Where did the sound come from? Didn't come from next door. Didn't come from down the street. Underscore that. Where did it come from? There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What, who came into that room? The Holy Spirit. Where did He come from? He came from heaven. Why does that matter? Well, go back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Go back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 where Jesus... He's talking to his, his disciples. He's talking to those followers of his in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. The kingdom of God's going to come. When's it going to come? In their lifetime. We've already got the time nailed down. We've got the right time. How is the kingdom going to come? Is it going to come secretly? Will it come when, when men uh, don't expect it and they don't see it and they don't recognize that it has come? Jesus says the kingdom of God is going to come with power. Now add to that Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, again a verse that we've noted uh, for a, a couple other points already, but Jesus told them in Luke 24 and verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. You go back and read John 14, 15, and 16. The Holy Spirit's coming. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with, the same word we saw in Mark 9 and verse 1, the kingdom of God will come with power, until you are endued with power, but here's an added detail. Where is the power going to come from? The power is going to come from on high. It's not going to come from next door. It's not going to come from down the street. The kingdom's going to come with power and it's going to come from on high. Now remember where the Spirit came from in Acts chapter 2. There came from heaven the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now I'll go to Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, right before Jesus ascends into heaven, He turns to His disciples. He turns to them and He says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you shall receive, same word we saw in Mark 9, 1, same word we saw in Luke 24, 49, kingdom come with power. You'll be endued with power from on high. In Acts 1 and verse 8, you will receive power. But when? How will we know when the power has come? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you get to Acts 2, all of these promises of Jesus are coming together. The power of the kingdom from on high when the Spirit would come upon them is right there in Acts 2, verses 2 through 4. We've got the right time. We've got the right men. We've got the right place. We've got the right power. What else do we have? In Acts chapter 2, we have the right audience. Who's there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5? There were gathered there, dwelling there in Acts 2 and verse 5, in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from where? From every nation under heaven. You know, sometimes we might read through this and we might not, we, we might just read through that and say, okay, that's just an insig insignificant detail. Oh, no, it's not. What difference does that make? Well, go back to Isaiah chapter 2. We saw in Isaiah chapter 2 at the end of verse 2 in that prophecy about the coming kingdom where the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2 that all nations shall flow into this kingdom, this church, this house of God. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something if God started His church in some little corner of the world where not many people heard about it, knew about it, or could be a part of it? Wouldn't it be something if He just trekked His disciples out in the desert and said, Hey, you know, man's going to reject us anyway. 
Man's going to reject the concept of the church anyway. Let's just go out here and let's enjoy it ourselves and keep it to ourselves. No. In prophecy, all nations shall flow unto it. And Acts 2 and verse 5, who is gathered there in the city of Jerusalem? Devout men from every nation under heaven. And so what did Jesus say to do in Matthew 28, verse 19? Go therefore and make disciples of, of who? Of all nations. Here we are in Acts 2. They are already beginning to fulfill that great commission. In Acts 2, we see the birth of the right church. Because we have in Acts 2 the right time, the right men, the right place, the right power, the right audience. And guess what they're preaching? They're preaching the right message. Wish we had time to go back and see the promises that Jesus made to His apostles in those upper room chapters of John 14, 15, and 16. How He promised them, you don't need to worry about what you are going to say because those words are going to be given to you. But just go back again to Luke chapter 24. Again, Luke 24 in the book of the beginning of the book of Acts, they dovetailed together. They're written by the same author in Luke chapter 24 in verse 44. Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Here's the words that I spoke to you. Now in John chapter 16, Jesus told them the spirit of truth is going to come and he is going to guide you into all truth. Chapter 14, he said he's going to bring to you remembrance everything that I taught you. And so Jesus is about ready to leave and he says, you know what? Here's everything that I've taught you. And everything that I taught you, everything I've done had to be done in order to fulfill what was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then he opened their understanding in verse 45. And he said it was necessary in verse 46 that the Son of Man had to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47 is the key for what we're looking at. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name beginning at Jerusalem. Wouldn't it be something if we had all of these other details right? But when we got to the sermon part of Acts chapter 2... Peter decided to wing it. I mean, you know Peter. Wouldn't Peter, you know, well, you know, maybe I'll just try to wing this one on my own and see how it turns out. Wouldn't it be something if the apostles, what if, what if James and John had been so full of themselves that, you know, we're, we're going to sit at the right hand and the left hand of the Lord. We, we can handle this on our own. What if they had started preaching their own doctrine? Then we would not have had the birth of the right church. We might have had all these other things right in Acts chapter 2, but it would not have been right if they did not have the right message. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's happening in Acts chapter 2? The fullness of the gospel is being preached for the very first time. And at the end of that sermon... In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, when Peter said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you have crucified, what's the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, this same Jesus whom you've crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, verse 7, they were cut, pricked to the heart, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now here's Peter, what's he going to say? Is he going to come up with an answer on his own? What must we do in order to be saved? What did Jesus tell them to preach in Luke 24 and verse 47? That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in my name beginning at Jerusalem. What does Peter preach in Acts 2 and verse 38? Acts 2 and verse 38. Is that some Church of Christ verse that they've stuck in their Bibles so that they can teach about baptism and and that being connected to the remission of sins? Where did Peter get this idea? He got it from Jesus. He said, repent, because Jesus told him to teach that. And let every one of you be baptized, because Jesus told him to teach that. In order that you might obtain the remission of sins, because Jesus told him to teach that. You get to Acts 2, and the right church is given birth to because the right message is being proclaimed. If the right message was not proclaimed, these people could not be saved. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If they hadn't preached the gospel, there's nobody being saved in Acts chapter 2. 
But because the right message was there, the right church could come about. When they were doing their preaching, they were preaching the right name. In Acts 2 and verse 21, in this quote from Joel chapter 2, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 2 and verse 38, he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Peter understood, the apostles understood, the authority by which their message had any power was because it came through the name of Christ. They weren't going to preach on their own name. They were not going to found the church, establish the church on their own name. It was going to come about through the reality of the right name, the name of Christ. And the reason they did that, again, the verses are on the screen for you, but that's what Jesus said to do. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached, how? Luke 24, verse 47, in my name. Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, what? Into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, and verse 26, Jesus said, the Father is going to send the Helper in my name. There was an understanding that this church was not about these 12 apostles. It was all about the name of Christ, by His authority, by His power. When you come to Acts 2, you have the establishment of the right church, the birth of the right church, because it's the right time, because there were the right men, the apostles there, because they were in the right place of Jerusalem, it was the right power of the Holy Spirit coming, it was the right audience, men from every nation under heaven. They were preaching the right message of repentance and remission of sins. They were preaching in the right name, the name of Christ. And finally tonight, I want us to see that this right church came into existence because there was the right result. Because these men did everything else right, it led to the result that God had intended. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible says, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. Exactly what they were told to do is exactly what they did. They gladly received the word that was proclaimed to them, and they were baptized. And on that day, there were about 3,000 souls added. Added. Added where? Added to whom? Well, we could go over to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 and see that those who become Christians, that God adds them to the book of life. He registers their names in heaven. So perhaps we could say they were added to the registry of heaven. But drop down to verse 47. In verse 47, in the King James, the New King James versions, the Bible says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Acts chapter 2, because everything else was right, and because everything else was done right, these individuals became a part of the right church. They didn't become a part of a man-made church on that day. There was no man-made church on that day. They did not become a part of some denomination on that day. There were no denominations in existence on that day. They became a part of the church that God had planned from eternity. The church that God had pinpointed the very time it would come into existence. And when they obeyed the right message they became a part of the right church. As you think about that tonight, what church are you a part of? Are you a part of a church that was started by a man or are you a part of the church that was started by the man, the Son of Man, the Son of God? Are you a part of a church that finds its origins in the last few centuries? Or are you a part of the church that finds its origin on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? 
Are you a part of a church that finds its beginnings on the, on, in, in, the, uh, in the United States of America and that's where it started or in Europe somewhere? Or are you a part of the church that finds its foundation in the city of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago? The ways of the Lord are right. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. When we come to a study of what the Bible teaches about the church, may we have the heart of Apollos, who recognized he had a lot of other things right about his understanding of God's will, but he was wrong in one area. May we have the heart that says, you know what? If I'm wrong in this area, then I need to get right. Are you right with God tonight? Are you a part of that church that he established? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, Paul says, here's how you become a part of that church. He says, for by one spirit... We were all baptized into the one body. There's only one body. There's only one church. How do you get into that one church? You repent and you be baptized for the remission of your sins in order that you might be added unto the church by the Lord himself in order that you might be registered by the Lord in heaven. When Peter in Acts chapter 11 looked back At Acts chapter 2, Peter said, that was the beginning. He says that's when it all started. We've looked tonight at the beginning of the church. The birth of the right church. Are you a part of that church? Have you been baptized into Christ, baptized into that one body? Have you been faithful in your service to His cause? If we can help you in any way tonight, then please come as together we stand and sing.